Hi guys, welcome to my channel, The Vintage Watch Guy. Hope you enjoy the video. I want to talk to you today about Rolex. You may have heard that watch collectors have sort of a Rolex cycle. So initially, before you know anything about watches, you think Rolex is the best watch ever made, uh, and the so-called average person aspires to own a Rolex. Then, you know, now that we have the internet, people uh, want to have the best of everything, so they feel like they need to sort of Yelp and review and check it out. Like you go to Hodinkee and Block to Watch and the other watch blogs. When you discover other watches, you find that uh, there's IWC, there's Patek, there's Vacheron, uh, there's Audemars Piguet. Then you discover, then you feel that, oh, well, maybe Rolex isn't a connoisseur's watch. Everybody loves Rolex. Everybody appreciates Rolex. And you think, think well, Rolex is, to your, in your mind, it becomes sort of a common thing. You're not something a connoisseur wants. And, you know, someone who really gets into it, uh, buys some watches, gets burned by some complicated watches with that are unreliable and have expensive repairs, and then end up eventually going back to Rolex. Well, I think that is very true. You know, certainly happens to a lot of people to some extent. Uh, happened to me as well. Uh, that's why I wanted to share with you some information about the history of wristwatches and what about Rolex makes it special or important. So in the beginning, you know, the world had pocket watches. Uh, pocket watches, you can see they're relatively large. And they were... Uh, what a man had. A man had a pocket watch because a man needed to be precise. Uh, people who had precision jobs, like people who ran the railroads, where it was very important to be on time so that the trains didn't hit each other and that the passengers were happy, uh, they had wrist watches. I mean, excuse me, they had pocket watches. And so wrist watches weren't really something that were considered a man's item. They were uh, sort of like baubles, they were a bracelet, uh, they were decorative, uh, it was uh, for women, it was considered sort of a piece of jewelry or a piece of fashion. And they were, because they were small, they're unreliable. If you compare the size of a wristwatch to a pocket watch, you can see this is a Rolex Oyster, this is a pocket watch. And you can see the pocket watch is much larger, therefore the balance wheel inside, which is the beating heart of the watch, is much uh, larger and can therefore be much more precise, precisely made. So, enter Hans Wilsdorf. Hans Wilsdorf is the legendary founder of Rolex. He was a German orphan uh, who was supported by his uncles. They were a wealthy family. He went to several different boarding schools. Eventually, he found his way to England. Uh, England at that time, or Great Britain, uh, in the early 1900s, ruled the world. You know, it had uh, colonies overseas. It was really the first wave of globalization. Uh, the, the sun never set on the British Empire. And a lot of people who wished to make their fortune moved to England at that time. So he initially started as a British agent to a Swiss company that made watches and found himself very fascinated by precision and timing. His job was to wind the pocket watches and test them for accuracy. And during that time, he observed that certain pocket watches were more accurate than others. And uh, just by random uh, bell curve, uh, certain watches were at one end of the bell curve where they were very, very precise, just the way they were made. So he put those aside and read, you know, have them uh, sort of rate them as being more accurate and sold them at a premium. This inspired him to form his own company in 1905, uh, which was incorporated in England. In 1908, he came up with the name Rolex. Uh, unlike a lot of other watch companies, Rolex wasn't the name of the founder. It wasn't the name of, uh, you know, Mr. Patek or Mr. Adamars. It was actually a name that came, he came up as a marketing term. It was short, five letters. Uh, it evoked the sound of a watch being wound. And it uh, was was something that easily fit on the dial and uh, was a good, you know, could easily be pronounced in any language. Uh, so at the time, 
you know, a lot of people didn't take wristwatches seriously, as they said. You know, it, it was considered a pocket watch was the proper watch. Uh, so he sort of set out to change that. Uh, World War I was really a time where uh, wristwatches started to become popularized. I, I don't have an example of this, but I have this book, Legendary Wristwatches. Really recommend it. They show an example here of something called a trench watch. Get that in the center there. A trench watch is uh, something that looks like a pocket watch, and a lot of times it was a woman's pocket watch, a small pocket watch, and they added these sort of thin wire lugs that were welded onto the case, and they were uh, brought to the brought to the front uh, during World War One for officers to wear. Uh, during battle uh, because it was not convenient to pull a pocket watch out of your pocket, click it open, look at it. And at that time, war was becoming more precise. Your attacks, when you went over the trench and went to attack the other trench, everyone had to leave at the same time because a lot of people were going to get hit by machine guns and people were going to die. So it's important that you send a large wave at the same time. So officers need to coordinate the timing of, you know, first the artillery shelling and then, you know, over the top. And you needed to it was much more convenient to have a wristwatch in order to do that. Another feature of these kind of watches, um, you know, you see it almost looks like a pocket watch. You see there's a hinge here, like a pocket watch has, a crown from winding. Uh, and, you know, as I said before, the thin wire lugs, the strap. Um, and you can see also that the numerals have a heavy layer of radium, as well as the hands. You see these, uh, what are called cathedral hands, and the radium helped you see the watch at night. Uh, this is before they appreciated how dangerous radium was. So, going back to Rolex, you know, after World War I, all these officers came back from the war, and as often happens in fashion, the military applications, and especially military applications by officers, you know, sort of led the way for fashion as to what men's fashion would be. For example, the trench coat was another thing that had come out at that time. And so wristwatches started to become more popular. Initially, a lot of the watches had this look. Uh, people were tired of these sort of trench watch looking things. They felt they were sort of stuck together. So they had uh, more rectangular watches with a style, Art Deco in the 20s and the 30s. Uh, this is a Hamilton Sectron, uh, sometimes called a doctor's watch because of the large subseconds. And you can see the sort of the Art Deco, Deco numerals, uh, the Art Deco case with the uh, step sides. And the rectangular case made it very distinct from the trench watches of that time that had preceded it. Here's a Longines. Oh, this Sectron dates to the 30s. Longines, this one, this movement actually uh, dates to 1949, but gives an example of what a lot of these Art Deco watches look like. Uh, again, rectangular case. So going back to Rolex, the problem with the rectangular case is that uh, it's very difficult to get them to be waterproof. If you look at the back of a lot of Hamilton Sectrons, for example, you see that... Uh, that the edges especially tend to get worn down and uh, water can leak through. Rectangular cases just naturally are not prone to being waterproof. Um, so Rolex, you know, had a few different things that were making it hard for wristwatches to be adopted. Uh, one was accuracy. Again, uh, pocket watches were larger and perceived as more accurate. Another one was uh, that Pocket watches were worn in your pocket. Uh, they were and very protected. They'd sit in your vest pocket. But wristwatch, it's exposed. It's out there on your wrist. You know, it can rain. You may need to wash your hands. And water could get into the movement and cause it to rust. So these two things, accuracy and waterproofness, were the big impediments. And Rolex was a big pioneer in both of these areas. In both instances, it wasn't the first company to to come up with a solution, but it was the one, much like Apple today, they came up with a user-friendly, easy-to-use solution. So the first real waterproof watch was something called the Omega Marine. Let me see if I can find a picture of it. 
it was a watch that was rectangular, like other watches of that time in the 20s. It came out in 19... I think it came out in the early 1920s. And it, Omega's always been an innovator. They actually tested the watch and uh, dunked it in water and uh, submerged it, I think, in the lake in Lake Geneva. A little bit hard time finding a picture here. Uh, but what it was, was a rectangular watch that had a waterproof case around it with a lock. So you put this case, you click it together, you would lock it, and then it would provide a sort of like an outer case. Uh, and that, that provides some waterproofness. But if, obviously that was not an extremely user-friendly thing. First, you had to remember to lock it. Also, you couldn't access any of the, the crown or the functions of the watch when it was, when it was locked tight. Uh, it was cumbersome. Uh, so even though it was the first, it wasn't very user-friendly. So then comes Rolex in 1926 with the Rolex Oyster case. The hallmark of an Oyster case is a screw down back. Uh, you can see the little ridges here to allow the tool to be able to screw it down tighter. It was made in uh, two or initially three pieces, but then later two pieces. And uh, by having the case screw in, it created a watch that was waterproof. And a waterproof watch could be, uh, was also in addition to not getting uh, destroyed when you wash your hands or uh, even when it went for a swim or when it rained, it also uh, was dustproof. So any kind of debris, uh, dust that would get easily get into a case and cause movement to gum up uh, would would be pushed, would be kept out. Oh, just to backtrack a little bit, uh, the other thing about about watches was that they were not perceived as precise. And Rolex was really a pioneer for that area too. They went, they really went for it. In 1914, they had uh, a number of Rolexes that were approved as marine chronometers by the Q Observatory, which is the Royal Observatory of Great Britain. Uh, at that time, the testing was five positions, two temperatures, and it was for 45 days as opposed to day, only a 15 day uh, for COSC certification. Getting certified as a marine chronometer was a big deal because a marine chronometer was a device uh, that went inside of a, a ship and using the very precise timing, you were able to compare your uh, time, your local time, which you determine by uh, looking at the sun, to a, a known time, Greenwich Mean Time. And by looking at the difference between that, you could determine uh, what your uh, longitude was. And this was really a major breakthrough. There's a book about longitude where it talks about uh, John Harrison and the clocks. I really suggest you read it. It's really a fascinating story. Uh, but this problem, but being certified as a marine chronometer meant that you that a tiny wristwatch was just as good as these big, uh, large pocket watches uh, that went in these special cases. If you see a marine chronometer, you see that it goes in a special case that has springs to keep it level while, it's being, while the, the ship uh, pitches back and forth. Um, that something that's small and could go on your wrist could be as accurate as that. Well, that really went a lot towards proving that wristwatches could be accurate, should be adopted. And these Q observatory marked dials uh, on some of these movements today are very, very collectible. Uh, so just going back to waterproofness, uh, the problem, you know, was that, you know, you, Rolex advertised these watches as the Oyster. It's waterproof, a waterproof watch. But the problem was people were not used to having a waterproof watch, and uh, they often would leave the crown open uh, to set their watch. And then they would go swimming, and they'd come back, oh, the watch is full of water. What happened? I thought it was waterproof. So the next step for Rolex was to uh, create... Uh, to create a self-winding movement so that people would not have to unscrew their, would not unscrew their crowns and then forget them. And the, when you had a self-winding watch, you know, as you went on through the day, the watch would uh, wind by itself. 
you leave it on your wrist, put it on your nightstand at night, put it back on in the day, and you're good to go. You wouldn't uh, have to wind your watch. You wouldn't have to open this screw down crown and so that there would be less chance of having a, a mistake. Uh, so in 1931, again, they weren't the first on this. There was something called the Harwood Bumper, uh, which preceded them, which came out in the 20s. John Harwood, brilliant guy, came up with uh, bumper movement, uh, where it's the rotor, instead of spinning 360 degrees, uh, would only go partially and it would hit against something. So that's why they call it the bumper. It bumps against uh, the two ends, springs on both ends, and it goes back and forth. As opposed to uh, automatic rotor, uh, which goes through the full uh, circle as it goes either direction. Uh, but the hardwood bumper, um, you know, was a good movement. Bumper movements were used later uh, when Rolex patented this uh, full, the 360 degree rotor. Uh, several of them companies, notably Omega, uh, came up with the bumper movements. They're very reliable. Uh, but first of all, they're a little bit more difficult to manufacture. They're more expensive. Um, uh, they're, they're, you notice it, the, the little bumps. Nowadays, we consider it charming, or some people consider it charming, but at that time, noticing the bumps probably wasn't uh, as desirable. Um, and, you know, the the uh, dominance of the 360 degree rotor and its ultimate superiority is really shown by the fact that very few bumper movements exist today. And almost all the automatic wristwatches have adopted the same kind of 360 degree rotor. Uh, so once they had the self-winding component, uh, you had basically the a, a the ideal wristwatch. You had a movement that was uh, accurate. It was uh, certified, for example, as a you can see that chronometer there, right on the dial. It uh, was branded Rolex. There's the crown, and it was had an oyster case, so it's waterproof, with a screw-down crown, suitable for swimming, and at the same time, it uh, was also self-winding, so you never really had to op open that crown. It was very user-friendly. You wouldn't forget and leave the thing open. And their marketing has really shown off uh, when they sent uh, Mercedes uh, Gleitz who was a uh, British woman who was the first one to swim the English Channel. And uh, the first time they, she swam it, it seemed like, it seemed like, uh, you know, there, there weren't enough people to verify that she had gone. So she had to swim the second time. And the second time, Rolex got wind of this, and Hans Wilsdorf had her swim with a Rolex oyster around her neck. Uh, she didn't wear it on her wrist because she thought it might obstruct her swimming. So she wore it on a chain around her neck and she almost made it across the English Channel. Uh, just off the coast of France, she uh, needed to be uh, rescued. But, you know, the, but the next day, you know, Hans Wildorf knew it would be all in the papers, Mercedes Glaines uh, had swum the English Channel and she swam it with a Rolex Oyster around her neck. And she said it worked perfectly. Uh, so that, you know, that was sort of the one of the early times that Rolex really advertised itself as a sports watch, as a, in that instance, a swimmer's watch. And, you know, the Rolex to me has always been that the watch, you know, has its characteristics that are shown by this uh, early, what's called a bubble back. Uh, it's called a bubble back because the back protrudes because the automatic uh, winding movement is sort of attached to the back of the, of the main movement uh, with the rotor and such. The watch, you know, was seen as a, a sports watch and it's accurate, it's waterproof, it's self-winding, it's user-friendly, durable, reliable. And you can see that this sort of original, to me, sort of archetype of Rolex was really, you know, led itself to uh, Rolex being perceived as a tool watch, a sports watch, you know, accurate, not, not fussy, you know, they didn't really uh, engage in uh, high complications, fragile watches. This was a robust watch that was meant to be worn every day. 
And, you know, Rolex still has a reputation today. Um, and the only complication that they really put in there, the 1977, much more modern Rolex, is the, uh, is the date complication, a very practical complication to create the date just, uh, which they did in the early 50s and is still their top seller today. But again, you see this watch, which is from 1977, uh, has a lot of the features of the, of the other one. It has a uh, superlative, superlative chronometer, uh, the Rolex logo, uh, and the Oyster case. You see the same sort of, um, uh, this sort of jimping, which allows you to screw the case on, uh, screw the case back on and off with the tool. And again, an automatic self-winding movement uh, with a screw down crown. This is another more modern Rolex from 2001, a, a sports watch, uh, Explorer, and it has the same basic characteristics. It's a chronometer, a screw down crown, and oyster case. And you can really see, you know, they're, they haven't made many high complications. You won't find a Rolex uh, perpetual calendar. The Rolex uh, triple calendars, triple calendars with moon phase, those are very rare. Obviously, they make a chronograph, um, but their other main watch, you know, the Daytona, obviously very famous. But their other main watch that they make is the Submariner, which, you know, it has a it has a bezel, but essentially it's a it's a time only watch, uh, which is just made even much more robust uh, with an oyster case and a screw down crown. Um, and then also you can see that their dress watches have always sort of lagged. Uh, if you look at their historical dress watches, uh, they're generally not considered as collectible. Uh, and if you look at the Cellini line, uh, not very popular. I don't see a lot of people wearing those. The sports models are what they what are collectible. But you can see the DNA in tool watches, sports watches. Uh, you can see this DNA of Rolex with the Oyster case and the chronometer rating. Uh, so that's uh, my video today. I hope you guys enjoyed and catch you in the next one.